today about the uh, DMAIC process that we use in a remote area of Liberia, West Africa. Uh, to kind of uh, give you just a, a brief background, uh, pr approximately in about 2008, I was introduced to a Liberian pastor who, um, by nature of who I am, I ask a lot of different questions. And um, so I was asking him a lot of questions. We were at a party, and uh, the, the gentleman asked me, he said, uh, would you like to come to one of our meetings here in the U.S. so we could actually, you know, like see what we're doing and so forth? And I ended up going to my first meeting, and after the meeting, they asked me to be the board chairman for their organization. So, um, so being involved with the organization about a year after uh, being involved with the organization and, and actually my wife and myself contributing um, various donations to the organization, I said to my wife, I said, we really need to go over to Liberia, West Africa, and actually see what's going on and making sure that they're using uh, the funds and so forth properly to set up their villages and clinics and, and so forth. So that's how I, I originally got involved with this organization. As a result of it, uh, it became a 501c3, and um, while I was over in Liberia, West Africa, I used the DMAIC process to actually reform uh, the village over there and to put improvement areas in place. Um, the one good thing about Liberia, before I start the presentation, is um, they had years and years of civil war, and as a result of coming out of civil war in an African nation, our country, I should say, um, they were very, very receptive to uh, anything that anybody could offer to help them, number one. And number two, a little bit um, which was advantageous for myself was they do speak English. It's it's almost like a brogue, um, like a, not even like a South African type English dialect, but they do in fact speak English. What is the light of Marty? Um, I ask that you just bear with me for the first maybe seven or eight slides because I really have to um, give you a picture of what I was up against when I started to do this improvement process in Liberia and um, basically what the country was coming out of as far as the Civil War. And then we'll get into a little bit of the technical uh, improvement tools and so forth that were used as far as a quality standpoint. What is the light of light? What is the light of Marty? Well, the light of Marty is a nonprofit organization. It's a registered IRS 501c3. This nonprofit was named after uh, Marty Herb, which is my mother-in-law, my, my wife's mother, who is now deceased. Uh, Marty believed that any and every child should receive a basic education. Currently, the organization resides in Thorndale, Pennsylvania, which is approximately about 70 miles west of the city of Philadelphia, with an active board representing uh, disciplines and expertise in many leadership, managerial, and strategic positions within business, industry, and government. And we do have two members who are on our board of directors who are from the Liberia, so they're Liberian. So we, so we do have... Uh, based not not a bias per se, but you know somebody who's actually lived there and has come over to the state, so they kind of know uh, the background of the government over there and different things that, that needs to happen as far as shipping and so forth. Uh, what is the light of Marty's vision and mission? Well, our vision in the light of Marty is to generate an abundance of funding to fulfill the dreams of the organization. Our mission is that we're empowering people through education and funding to use their talents and resources to achieve a prosperous, prosperous life and a self-sustaining environment where racial, educational, or economic disadvantage is a race through personal and community development. And there's a classic phrase that I use within any nonprofit. I serve on various boards of directors and nonprofits. But one of the classic phrases I always like to say is, without margin, there is no mission. So without the proper funding to go over with an air flight fare and resources to do what you need to do, you really can't accomplish your mission. In this case, it was go over to 
put in an actual school, a village, supply clean water, and so forth. So we did have the proper funding to do that. At this time in my presentation, I'd just like to note that uh, we are holding uh, questions till the end, and we'll use the chat room for that. So if you can hold off any questions and, and uh, keep yourself muted at this time until, until the proper time, that would be great. The purpose of our trip to Liberia, West Africa, was we wanted to make an assessment of both the community over there as well as the current school system they had and teach the villagers how to improve the community. Now, one of the things I'll get to specifically, but right now I'll just mention it, is that when the Civil War came in the countries of Liberia and Sierra Leone, the educational system came to a halt. So here were you know, elementary school children, like second and third grades, and typically maybe you're 10, 11 years old. Well, when, this, when the Civil War came, the educational system came to a gridlock, meaning that when the schooling system started up, our new second grade, our new third grade had uh, 10 and 12 year olds go into it. We also had 18 year olds in our third grade because the school system started when the war stop so there was years that children became uh, adolescents and uh, they didn't you know receive any kind of an elementary education so they started back to whatever grade they left as far as when the uh, when the school system came to uh, reopen after the Civil War as you can see on the left hand side of the screen that was a typical uh, village that we were in and uh, on the right hand side um, that's myself, uh, I'm a redhead, my wife's a redhead, and then there were other people that were actually from Liberia uh, when, we, when we went over on a trip. Uh, the goals of the trip, uh, we went to a town called uh, Lower Johnsonville, and I'll get into that in the next slide exactly where that is in West Africa in the country of Liberia. But our goals of the trip were we wanted to um, – assess the needs of the community. Uh, like I said, the native language in the country is English, which, which is a plus. Uh, we wanted to, to, secondly, have the right people involved in the process of improvement. Uh, third is we wanted to educate the people with simple improvement tools that they can understand where improvement was needed. Fourthly, we wanted to have the people realize that they were the stakeholders of the process that we were simply not just, say, uh, missionaries, per se, went over there and were going to, like, rebuild their villages. We wanted them to rebuild the villages and to implement the school system and so forth. We would aid in planning and maybe supplying some of the funding from American funds, but we wanted them to do the work. Uh, the fifth was we wanted to increase the self-esteem and attitude of these stakeholders to realize they can make a difference on what they were going to learn through this DMAC process. Uh, the Lower Johnsonville School Community center, centers around an educational system and a missional effort that's called Shalka. Shalka uh, is basically, uh, it's basically an acronym that stands for uh, sharing, loving, and caring through education and community development. Uh, the people that are standing in this photo are actually uh, the principal of the school, the mayor, as well as uh, what I would call probably like a senator. It was like a governmental official who has a, a political role in the major voting in the Congress. So where is Delaware to Liberia? Uh, I know that many uh, on this call might be from various parts of the U.S. Uh, have Delaware is I'm actually not from Delaware. I live in Pennsylvania, but I was I my section of ASQ is in Delaware. So if you look at the state of Delaware and you look at the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean, Liberia sits on that western part of Africa at the top northern section, yeah, probably in about the middle of uh, Africa, but towards the top there. And it's approximately about 4,000 miles southeast from, from, from Delaware. Uh, where is this remote area? Uh, well, 
many people don't realize this, but the capital of Monrovia in Liberia, that's the capital of Liberia, Monrovia, uh, was actually named Monrovia because uh, President James Monroe actually colonized uh, Liberia. And uh, if you know a little bit of history there, uh, a lot of the slaves actually came over to the U.S. and then uh, President Mon uh, Monroe actually sent them back to colonize the uh, western country of Liberia. So that's where the town name Monrovia comes from. But Lower Johnsonville is probably about anywhere between 20 to 25 miles north from the city of Monrovia. These are some facts about Liberia. And uh, to kind of paint the picture of what I was up against when I went into this village to try to help them improve their village. Uh, some facts about Liberia. Uh, they have about uh, over a quarter million kids, 340,000 kids that have been orphaned due to the 16-year war, as well as uh, children that have AIDS. Uh, additionally, uh, just recently, over say the last five to seven years, uh, they've had 12,000 orphan children due to Ebola. And, and uh, a lot of the children that are actually orphaned from Ebola uh, actually were orphaned because their parents died of Ebola, and then the aunts and uncles didn't want the children because they, because of their lack of understanding of the disease. They thought if you got a child from an Ebola parent, even though that child didn't have Ebola, that somehow they were going to affect their ch ch uh, family and children. So a lot of these kids just became orphaned because people were scared. Um, they were uh, Most kids are orphaned, uneducated children often become victims of sex trafficking and other illegal activities in order to survive. Um, there's a huge child labor workforce uh, defined as children under 16 years of age. Essentially, one out of every five children are in the workforce. The child uh, literacy rates are the sixth lowest in the world. Uh, the adult literacy rate is only uh, 43%. A lot of these statistics come directly from either the uh, World Trade Bank or from the uh, CIA uh, informational foreign pool. Uh, currently, uh, the average income per household is 410 U.S. dollars uh, per year, and 64% of the population live under the poverty line. So, and when I say $410 per year for the family, there might be six or seven people in that family. So collectively, they're only making less than $500 U.S. a year. And still, as of to this day, uh, only 63% of the uh, population have access to drinking water. That's, that's clear and bacteria-free, almost like a, what we would consider a potable uh, water. Challenges that Liberia faces after years of civil war was created was they have a generation of uneducated adults and children. They also have an educational system that stalled until the war was ended. Like I said, it's it's kind of uh, very eye-opening when you visit a classroom and you see 10-year-olds with 16-year-olds and 18-year-olds just because when the war ended, the children went back to school, whatever the grade they stopped at prior to the war starting. They had a devastated economy with very few job opportunities. Uh, they also have uh, limited electricity. Uh, at the start of the Civil War, uh, rebels came in and they actually uh, destroyed the, higher the hydroelectric plant, which was in the uh, city of Monrovia, which supplied the country their electrical grid, as well as the rebels stole all the telephone wire and electrical wire off the telephone poles so they could sell it for scrap metal so they could buy guns to, to fund their, uh, their, their uh, mission. And then uh, they have limited pipe water. A lot of, a lot of the water uh, people carry in urns over their heads and uh, ceramic jars over their heads. And uh, they get this, a lot of this water from streams that are extremely polluted. 
And now uh, the Ebola outbreak history, which I explained that uh, many children uh, are orphaned just because no, no aunt or uncle or neighbor will take them uh, due to the, the lack of understanding of what the actual virus was. Liberian, I talk a little bit now about the Liberian educational process and problems that they have because uh, there is a school in this uh, lower Johnsonville town that, that I, had, I had used people from the school, like the principal and the mayor of the town and so forth in this uh, DMAIC process. Uh, in the educational problems, students are below the grade level for their age. So for example, uh, what we would consider, say, a third, uh, uh, third grader in the U.S., uh, possibly their 10th graders are at a third grade education. So the students are well below their grade level for their age. Uh, secondly is the quality of education depends on the school the parents can afford. Although education is highly valued, it's prioritized by survival needs. Now, there is a gender bias in the country, and that is that boys are educated before girls. Approximately 36% uh, of the boys and 63% of the girls, so essentially six out of every 10 girls are illiterate just because of that's how the families over there in their culture uh, believe in education. They believe in educating the boys prior to the, to, to the girls. Uh, most schools have large classes. This gives less individual attention per, per student. Uh, there's currently the average runs 55 students per teacher. Uh, we were in classrooms over there that they had 106, 120 students per teacher. And if you can think of the uh, the disruption that happens in the classrooms, it's it's really uh, I've never, never seen anything like this. It, it's it's really terrible. And then many parents are uneducated. So with being uneducated, they can't support the students in their studies. So even basic mathematics like five plus three equals eight and so forth, a lot of the parents can't help their children with, with homework because they're just simply illiterate or do not have the uh, math aptitude to, to actually teach, to help their uh, children. I turn now to the DMI AIC process. Now that you have a picture of what I was up against and how the country runs both on an educational as well as a, a, as a social level. Uh, the DMAIC process, we wanted to basically explain what the methodology, the process, and the theory to the group. We wanted to conduct a brainstorming session with the group. Uh, we also, with that brainstorming session, we wanted to make sure we had the proper stakeholders involved in the process. We could have took all the teachers from the school, but if nobody could actually take action on the stuff that we did, there was no use of having that. So we, we, we kind of filtered the group, per se, where we had the mayor, the principal, uh, a couple parents from the school, and so forth. Uh, we reverted the brainstorming data into an affinity diagram, and then we used a flow chart the process with the group so they could understand the process we were going through to kind of give them a visual documentation of what we're talking about. Then we looked at the problem areas via a cause and effect diagram. We developed a glossary of operation definitions. This was a fun process altogether, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later on in some slides. We used multi-voting to gather data for our Pareto, and then uh, we de developed solutions to such Pareto areas of concerns. And then we committed to an action plan. And basically what it was was uh, they were actually to send us photos because we took a lot of photos when we were over there in 2009. And it took them a couple of years to get it done, but they did get it done. So the, their action plan was actually to get it implemented if we would send funds and then to document it by sending us uh, visual pictures of the process. Uh, the DMAIC process was to define uh, the project of improving the image of community and to define the stakeholders. To measure, we wanted definitions, flow charting, brainstorming, voting, affinity, cause and effect diagrams to actually measure what we were doing. We wanted to analyze this through a Pareto analysis and then do an evaluation of that analysis. 
We wanted to prove, improve through action items and new methods of operation. And we wanted to control, uh, ver verify, and validate improvement methods. Now, uh, a lot of the charts that you see might just be a pictorial of a, a something through a DMAIC process. I want to be very clear. Um, due to the fact that even the mayor and the congressman of the, uh, the village that we were in, they were extremely illiterate. And so a lot of what we did was on uh, blackboards. And blackboards, uh, the old blackboards that probably many of us used to have in not per se our college days, but maybe in our grade school days and high school days, uh, blackboard teaching is pretty much the dominant way of teaching in this country because A, they don't have audio visuals like we would have, especially computers and projectors and so forth. And secondly is um, there's really a limited amount of textbooks. So whatever the teacher writes on the board, that's what gets written into their uh, notebooks. And uh, sad to say, many of the schools that we went to and visited, uh, a lot of the teachers uh, would misspell words. Like for example, uh, there, the word there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, might be uh, spelled on the blackboard, T-H-U-R, and every student. So here you have one teacher spelling it wrong on the blackboard, and you have 121 students copying the wrong word into their book. So, um, so we, we kind of ran it the best way that we could run the process, and they, 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 they really got it, I have to admit. You know, they were very open-minded for people to help them. And then uh, control, we wanted to verify and validate the improvements that were made. Now, here I am in this picture, and this was an actual uh, training process that we went through. And I explained the process to the people there, as well as we took them through a brainstorming session and a cause and effect diagram and so forth. And believe it or not, this room actually represents like a mayor a governor, uh, a councilman. There's also uh, in African countries, especially Western African, uh, tribes are very prevalent. So we had um, a member of a tr who was the uh, tribal chief who was in our, uh, so, and we also had the uh, principal of the school as well as parents and uh, community uh, people and so forth. So between the local mayor, the local superintendent, the local tribesmen, chief tribesmen, uh, parents, teachers, they had, they're very big on town watch over there after the Civil War to make sure nobody's carrying any guns or anything like that. And then they neighbors to the school. So there's, um, in the uh, villages in Liberia, there's a lot of denominational schools. Like for example, in one block, there could be a Catholic school, an Episcopalian school, a Jehovah Witness school, a uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints school, um, Methodist school. So th there's, there's a lot of denominational schools in a very concentrated area. The public school system in Liberia is, uh, is, is as a portion of schools. So if there was 100 schools, there might only be 11 schools that are public. The other 89 schools would be a denominational school. We use the KISS process to explain what the DMAIC process was for these individuals. Uh, we went through, like, for example, we defined what is brainstorming. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, what is an affinity diagram? And l l let me first say with brainstorming, uh, that was an interesting process that we went through with them because um, in a foreign uh, culture, a lot of times uh, if the head tribesmen would talk, everybody else would become silent. Some people didn't share or participate. So we kind of had to like really uh, get them involved when we, when we encountered certain uh, cultural differences such as that. 
Then we went through, we took all these ideas from a brainstorming session, then we defined what uh, an affinity diagram was, and we put them all on the blackboard and made an affinity diagram. Then we went through what is flow charting, and we took them through various examples of uh, how, to, uh, how, to, how to make a, a cement brick, and we, we, we drew a flow chart, we went through that whole process. Uh, somebody, we also did a flow chart on how to make uh, a, a girl's blouse, like for the school, and that was very interesting too. And then uh, we went through a cause and effect diagram, and actually they got this right away. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, um, the two industries in Liberia are farming and fishing because they're right on the coast, on the Atlantic coast. So when we went through a, uh, a fishbone diagram and it was, okay, once we have the stuff up there, we're going to fillet the fish, uh, they got that, I guess, because of their, you know, their, their, uh, their profession. And then we went over uh, operational definitions, which was very important to the fact that many people don't have, have agreement on the same goals and don't have the find that they can measure them. We went through moldy voting and what moldy voting was. Then we went through a Pareto chart, and that was another area. Uh, we went through the history of uh, Alfredo Pareto and how he developed the chart. He was in Italy and the farming and the wealth and all. And they kind of got that too. And then we went over uh, what it is to develop solutions to these problems. So we went through to define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, but it was basically on their terms, and we kept it very, very simple so that they would understand the process. One of my favorite uh, classic problem definitions is a problem well-defined is a problem half solved, and I've used that for the last 35 years of my profession is uh, a lot of times if a work team doesn't adequately define what the problem is, they could spend weeks or even months going down the wrong road and not solving the problem. So once the problem is really adequately defined up front, usually you can uh, start your process to do that. And I, I really believe that they got that when we went through there. Um, we erased kind of the grumbling and complaints and we replaced it with facts. And in a, in a foreign country, um, you know, we have many disagreements in our workplaces here in the U.S., but if you would see people actually almost scream at each other, and then you realize they're not really mad at each other, they're just they they just have a disagreement on what on what you know a certain concept that they just don't have agreement on. Then another famous uh, managerial phrase when we were over there was, uh, "What are we giving you that you don't need?" And what do you need that we're not giving you? And this actually comes from the uh, late Peter Schultes. And uh, his two famous lines are, what are we giving you that you don't need? And what do you need that we're not giving you? Um, because what, would ha what was happening was before uh, my wife, myself, and another uh, part of our team that went over there, uh, we were actually sending clothing and we're actually sending uh uh, uh, school desks and so forth, and it was costing us an enormous, enormous amount of money in our shipping costs to get those items to them. And when we got over there and we started going through some of this DMAIC process, we realized that uh, a lot of this, uh, that we actually were, uh, a lot of this that we were actually uh, sending over there and paying for shipping we were better off sending over money, funds to them, and letting the people go to work and giving their economy a boost because they could, for example, they could make a desk for $10. They could make a child's desk for $10 out of wood over there. And it might cost us $35 or $40 to buy a desk here, another $40 to ship it over there. So they could make a desk for $10 and employ the economy or, or boost the economy while we were paying $80 to, to ship a desk over there. Uh, the other thing, and that kind of leads to the second statement is, 
what do you need that we're not giving you? And a lot of it, it was was funding. Um, they they surprisingly they do have access to pharmaceuticals there. They do have access to timber there. They do have access to cement there, but uh, some things like money they don't. So uh, so that's that's one thing. We took the village through a brainstorming process and. Uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to generate as many ideas as possible. In other words, get as crazy as we could and generate as many things as possible. Secondly, we wanted a co-tail or duplication of ideas, which is good, and we wanted to really stress that with them. We wanted to be respectful to one another while doing this process. And then we wanted to have fun in the process of completing uh, this exercise. Once we went through the brainstorming process, we turned that into an affinity diagram process, and they understood to use this tool would reduce the chaos. So from all the, uh, all the uh, brainstorming that we did on the blackboard and so forth, uh, once I instructed them and taught them about the affinity diagram, they kind of got that this diagram would reduce the chaos. The team had drowned with a lot of good ideas, and this was a really good rescue process for them. Our group needed some breakthrough thinking, and the team knew they had to establish broad issues and themes. We next went through the village flow charting process, and they understood to use this tool would explain the process. They stressed if you don't know how it works, how can you fix it? And that was kind of a I, I try to keep things as simple as possible. A is there was a high illiteracy rates even among the most uh, dominant people in their community, such as the mayor and the tribesmen and so forth. So they got the concept by using a flow chart that um, if they don't know how it works, how can they fix it when it doesn't work? And they kind of got that broad concept. Uh, they understood the importance of process documentation, and they understood the simplicity for helping others uh, or helping train others in the process. The documentation process, um, there's, you know, we have such a luxury over here that, you know, we, we, we document something, we email it or we scan it or we, uh, you know, take a, a photo with our phone of it and so forth. Over there, uh, there's cell phones and all. A lot of them don't have cameras in them and so forth. So. Uh, uh, basically, whatever they write in a copy book, that's pretty much their documentation. So it's important to get them to not only document things, but to keep the process of documentation safe and to make sure that a copy doesn't get burned or lost or anything else. Okay, going back to the fishbone, uh, like I said, the concept was very much understood because the country is consists of farmers and fishermen due to the uh, Liberia's ge geography to Africa. Um, so the cause and effect diagram, we told them the story of uh, Karu Ishikawa with the fishbone. And then we determined the head of the fish, the main characteristics. We determined that the fish had four to six major bones. We brainstormed many more causes for the four to six bones. And then we showed the group how to fillet the fish. And like I said, in the fishing industry, they, they understood how to fillet a fish and how to get rid of uh, the bones and so forth. Um, just to prove my point, uh, like I said, many of the farming and fishing villages are, uh, Liberia sits uh, basically above Cote de Ivory and it sits uh, west of Guinea and then uh, south of Sierra Leone. So Monrovia there uh, in the geographical area of, of the country is right uh, next to the Atlantic Ocean. So it's a huge fishing industry as well as there's a lot of farming. There's a lot of, a lot of fruits. Many, many people, uh, I, I always tell a quick story that uh, when I was over there, somebody had cut, their, their land is extremely fertile and they have a lot of fruit. So if you're walking down the street, there's banana trees and there's grapefruits and all, and you just pick something and you eat it. So they're not starving in this country. And I always tell the story that uh, I, was, I, was, I was actually driving down the street 
and somebody actually cut down a banana tree and made like a wooden post for in front of their hut. And there was actually leaves growing out of the uh, fence just to show you how fertile the country was. You know, I, I've never seen like bananas start to grow out of a fence before. Um, the village also had operational definitions. Uh, first, had them make a definition. So for example, we took the word uh, ASAP at a group exercise, which as soon as possible. And then we actually took things like, um, how would you define uh, a big fish? Uh, how would you define a small banana? And, and like everybody had their uh, definition of it. And then, we, then we talked a little bit about weight measurements and stuff like that. So they, they got the operational definition uh, concept. Uh, we simply define what something is and how it is measured. We brainstormed many terms we needed definitions for. And then we went, an example of this was, uh, what is cleanliness? Now, unfortunately, uh, the country of Liberia does not have a sanitation system of as we would think of even in America or even in some Middle Eastern uh, cities that would have sanitation systems. So a lot of the trash is just thrown off the side of the road. It's not uncommon for somebody to send something in a package, I'll say a piece of candy or something, and they take the wrapper off to eat the candy and they just throw the wrapper on the street. So definitions of cleanliness were very different from what we would think in the States or even in Europe. And then what does drivable mean uh, on a road? Their idea of drivable and our, our, our potholes in the U.S. would be a dream compared to some of the roads that you drive uh, on over in Liberia. Then we went through the village multi-voting process. Uh, Liberia's government is democratic. They just had Mama Ellen Sharif who was the woman president of Liberia. Uh, she had just ended her presidency and uh, there, I think it was about five or six months ago, but she was a president for a long time after the Civil War. Um, the the multi-voting process, they kind of really understood because um, where we have, for example, maybe three, four, five, six parties, if you go, uh, Democrat, Republican, Independent, maybe uh, 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 any other kind of party, whether it's Communist Party or any other party that we might have, they have as many as uh, 25, 45 parties. So when it comes to an actual uh, election in Liberia, they might have about 45 or 52 candidates who are running in that election. So when they understood the multi-voting process to get it down to one or two, uh, they, they could see the confusion in their own political party as a country that they could understood the more simplicity of this. Uh, so we had many, many uh, practice rounds uh, when, they, when we multi-voted on things. We had a secret ballot, but by hand raising from the group, we threw out either small number of votes or, or if somebody, you know, one of their votes was kind of a complaint more than an actual uh, positive vote for something, we kind of threw that out. We agreed ahead of time for some ground rules for that. And then we explained how our multi process uh, would evolve into a Pareto chart. We actually did a Pareto chart and uh, the village Pareto chart, uh, basically what I did, I, I think I said this before, is I told them the story of Alfredo Pareto and, you know, how the farmers in Italy and how the Pareto chart got, you know, invented. And then uh, we went through understanding what was the first step towards improvement, uh, understand ranking, percentage of total, cumulative, uh, understand the concept of the 80-20 rule that, you know, basically the 80% of your problems are coming from about 20% of your sources. It showed the group. Uh, what should be concentrated on first. And a lot of times uh, I realized that this might have been the most uh, relevant and the most important concept for them because when you get, uh, you know, 15, 25 people in a room and they really have, have no experience with this, 
to actually put it in terms that, listen, when we walk out of this at the end of a couple of weeks, we're going to actually have something that we can all agree on to work towards. And I think anything, that was probably the biggest accomplishment. So we went through all the basics of the Pareto chart. And if, like I said, they really, uh, they really appreciated that this technique came from a farmer because, like I said, a lot of, a lot of the people actually, one of the biggest industries in Liberia is they, uh, they farm palm trees for palm oil. And the palm oil is used, it's shipped all over out, throughout the world. I mean, they use it in Liberia for uh, cooking, but essentially they use it uh, in chocolate making and candy making. They use it in shampoo. So it's a very sought out product throughout the world, or world palm oil. So that's basically a lot of their farming. So what was discovered through the DMIC process? Well, we found out that there was poor road access for visitors to view their village. Uh, we stressed that it was very important that if anybody was going to donate significant money to improve this village, they probably wanted to come over to Liberia and see it. And to bring somebody over to Liberia and not be able to get them to the school or the village because of the poor roads uh, being destroyed, uh, that was very important. Also, another thing was there was no uniforms for either their students, their sport teams, the town watch. There was extremely poor cleanliness. I mean, they, it was almost a 5S confession where everything was extremely dirty. There was a lot of trash around. They, their building needed to be cleaned up. Essentially, just a repaint job would have been a major improvement. Uh, we uncovered the safety security was very important. Since these people came out of a civil war, the town watch thing is huge huge over there. They want to make sure that when they go to sleep at night that people just don't come into their uh, their, their, their uh, village and, uh, you know, disrupt it. They gave improvement tools for planning and problem solving. We gave reassurance of heading in the same direction, and we gave reassurance that the resources would be given. It's one thing to talk about all this stuff coming over. It's another thing when you actually train them and then you actually send the funding so they can make the improvements. Um, I'm going into my summary here of what we actually found out, and then we'll open this up for some questions through our chat box. Uh, the key causes of the uh, issues that we had with the village were uh, to fix the roads. To fix the roads uh, was 30% of our problem cumulative, because that was our highest. Then to clean up the trash, they really got that you know, people come into their village and there's trash and there's paper and there's just all kinds of uh, just debris all over the place uh, represented the highest two areas. A safe place security was uh, the third item, which represented 70 percent. And then the school uniforms was 82 percent. And uh, the number three, the safe place was huge because, uh, you know, coming out of a civil war, they want to make sure that their families and all are safe. So cumulative seven percentage, our first four areas were, were really the critical things. Some of the problem solving observations was we, we fixed the roads and we had trash cleanup, which was 52% of our cumulative. Security was number three. And then uh, what we found out was through the security, which we helped implement number four, number five, and number six, Light of morning supported a town watch area, so we supplied uniforms, flashlights, and so forth there. Um, to kind of show you where we were, uh, I wasn't kidding when I said potholes. If you look at the slide, this is where we came from. Uh, this is me sitting in a van trying to get to the school, and those potholes are puddles that could possibly be two and a half feet deep, okay? So, you know, get to the school, you know, you would get stuck in mud or you, or you, you know, br uh, flatten a tire or something. Uh, this is where we came as of April 2018. Uh, we fixed a lot of the roads. We had to put boulders and, you know, gravel and so forth. But we did fix a lot of the roads. And what was amazing over there is a lot of the uh, town mayor said, if you guys supply from the U.S., if you supply the funding so we can buy the gravel and all, 
we'll supply the labor for free, which was good. Uh, this is the thing with the trash. There's paper and debris and everything else. So we had a trash and a dumping problem, and the cleanliness really, really improved. They, they got the idea that, you know, you, you're really going to, really a beautified area is really going to attract, you know, people. And then there was no school uniforms or sport teams. As you can see, many of the kids are just in any uniforms. So what we did is, as of April, is our sports teams over there have somewhat of uniforms and so forth. And then our school children that are in Shalika in the village uh, have uh, actual uniforms on there. And a U.S. study that was conducted by the University of Nevada, Reno, found that uniforms in both schools and children's athletics gave a 42% better appearance to the community, a 50% clothing savings to the families, and 41% less gang uh, violence. This is what our building looked like uh, before. As you can see, it's very dark inside. This is what it looks like. It, like just drew uh, a coat of paint on the outside, and then on the inside, uh, uh, you, can, you can't see it that well, but on the top of the roof, we actually put uh, uh, sun, sun, sun uh, shade or areas in so they get more sunlighting. So the DMA process, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And if, if anybody here has their uh, black belt or green belt, DMA, I see this was a little humor. Uh, we try to explain to them what green belts were. We try to explain to them what black belts were. So we actually compromised on Liberian belts. It's a little DMIAC humor there. And uh, that's, that's it uh, from the light of morning. So at this time, if you go to your chat box and have any specific uh, questions, uh, Norval's going to read them to me, and uh, I'll answer them the best that I can. Okay, the chat box is now open and available for questions. If you do have questions for John, uh, please uh, go ahead and type them in. Uh, we'll wait here momentarily. Looks like we have a little more than five minutes before the hour, so we're still in pretty good shape on time. Okay, uh, first question, John, is what is the control timeline? Uh, could they could they be, is, is that the only question? Uh, that's the only part of the question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nancy, can you add a little more to that? Okay, uh, how often will data be rechecked to confirm it is in control, and how is it monitored? Okay, basically uh, what we do is we have them send uh, photos throughout the village of various areas that we specifically improve just to make sure that it's in a state that it can be visually verified that it hasn't been disrupted at all. Like for example, if, they, if like just say for example, we implemented the school uniform policy and so forth, we have them take pictures of us daily and weekly of the school, and you know you start noticing that you know 20% of the kids don't have uniforms on, you, you have a problem. Uh, same thing with the uh, trash and the cleanliness, the road issue. Pretty much, they have a very severe rainy season. So some of that they can't completely control, but after the rainy season, if they had the proper funding to get the gravel on all, it is repairable. Okay, next question is, uh, uh, somebody is asking if they could get a copy of the slide deck. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're, okay. we're, I, did you say you post that or whatever? Uh, what we'll do is uh, we do a follow-up 
email with folks who are online, uh, we'll do that, where we'll include links to the YouTube uh, recording as well as a link to the survey, and also uh, if we do have the slide deck, uh, we'll attach it as a PDF. Okay, got it. Let's see here. Oh, uh, question was, uh, how was this topic or project selected? Uh, okay, how it was selected was through the uh, brainstorming of the with with the uh, the group, the stakeholders that we had, and uh, each area. Like I said, basically what we did is we had we had a blackboard and we spent hours and hours uh, going over this uh, process. Like there was a whole training exercise as far as what things were and all, and then. Um, when we actually listed things on a blackboard, we, we just kept on voting on it until we had uh, pretty much uh, consensus of agreement that these were the areas that they really felt like uh, sh should be worked on. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, were there any audits done to confirm that funding went to the appropriate area? Yes. Um, Right now, there's approximately three American missionaries who uh, we use, who we have uh, Liberian bank accounts there, and they're the only ones that can access it. So it's, it's, it's controlled a lot more. Let me put it to you this way. Prior to 2009, 2010, um, there was a lot of corruption, even even with even within the organization that we were trying to help from the states. Once the money got it over there, uh, sometimes it would get used for stuff that wasn't really kosher for what it was supposed to get used for. But since that time, we have three missionaries over there, and uh, it, it is controlled. So it does go for the funding that's required. Okay, we, looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, how was this particular group selected, and why this particular town in Liberia? Uh, the particular town in Liberia was because in, in the beginning of the presentation, I explained that how I got involved with Liberia through uh, a pastor who was in the States who made me the chairman of his board, and this was the area that he concentrated in. Uh, that was num number one for the question. Number two for the question was uh, the pastor who joined, whose board I joined actually was on the trip with me, and he actually uh, identified, almost like through an organizational chart, who the key stakeholders were. In other words, if you get the head tribesmen and you get the mayor and you get the governor and you get the school principal and all, if you get them on board and they say change, the people follow. So that's basically why we, we selected who we did. Okay. Uh, that looks like that's pretty much it for questions. Uh, looks like we've gotten uh, close here to the time. Uh, Going to remind everybody that our next webinar is next Tuesday, April 10th. Uh, it'll be Lean Six Sigma in Healthcare Labs, Unclaimed Opportunity with Katie Castry, uh, who is a member of the St. Louis section. So we hope that many of you can join us uh, for that. i uh, like to thank John uh, for being our presenter today. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. And also to thank uh, all of you uh, for joining us as well. Uh, we hope to see uh, many of you uh, possibly uh, next week. And until that time, I'd like to wish everybody uh, a good rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye.